Today's topic is Sukkot and the Seven Wise Men. And um, you probably know that these are the Ushpizen, the famous uh, Ushpizen means visitors, guests, who by tradition appear, uh, at least in spirit, excuse me, in, the, uh, in every Sukkah um, throughout the land and indeed around the world. So I'd like to discuss the basis for this, a bit of the historical background uh, to it, some of the variant customs and the significance of the different approaches, and then at a deeper level to understand why is it that they, they visit our sukkah, what is the significance of that? So uh, let's just to start uh, with mentioning that the word Ushpizen is an Aramaic word, and the tradition of the Ushpizen derives from the Kabbalistic uh, literature. It's interesting that the matter is not um, expressed uh, explicitly in the Zohar. However, it is based on the Zohar. The Zohar mentions that uh, when a man sits in the sukkah, the shade of faithfulness, what's called the tzile di uh, is uh, surrounds him and he is uh, uh, reposing in the shade, so to speak, of the divine protection, and he is joined by Avraham Avinu, the patriarch Avraham, and five other tzaddikim, and David HaMelech. Uh, elsewhere, the Zohar, in a different passage, makes reference to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, who visit the sukkah, and because we're looking for seven altogether, although, again, the matter is not explicitly set out, but it's universally recognized that the other three will be Yosef, Moshe, and Aharon. The sequence is a subject to different uh, approaches, and we'll get to that uh, shortly. Now, the whole idea of Ushpizin, as I said, has its roots, has its origins in the Zohar, with the classic book of Jewish mysticism attributed to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the second century Tana. Uh, the Zohar has been accessible to uh, scholars and to, to uh, students of Torah since around the 13th century. Uh, uh, prior to that, it may have been transmitted only to a, an elite a group in an kind of esoteric way. And then in the fullness of time, it spread uh, throughout the Jewish world. And then it, when it was published, naturally, uh, in terms of the printing press, it spread much further. But I don't want to give a whole account of the history of Kabbalah. But this Minhag of Ushpizin today, as of now, is very popular, very widespread. One can hear, hear about it, read about it. Uh, there are songs about it. Uh, young children learn about it. Uh, there are sukkah decorations and adornments which are surround and relate to these seven great guests who come to visit the sukkah. However, it was not always that way. Even today, there are some circles that um, either... Um, resist or, or even, even um, let's say, um, reject the idea of the Ushpizin. And the reason for that is the resistance to the influence of Kabbalah itself. Uh, the Spanish and Portuguese community here in, uh, in uh, Britain and elsewhere, uh, they don't know about it. They don't, uh, so to speak, uh, believe in it. They don't practice. They don't invite the Ushpizin. Uh, the Yekis also uh, don't, although probably many of them do now, but traditionally they didn't. I'm sure that in United Synagogue uh, circles a generation or two ago, even those who celebrated Sukkos, who maybe even who had a Sukkah, not too many people in that category, but again, Ushpizin was not part of it. This is part, the, the popularity of Ushpizin is part of the general influence of Hasidic thought, Sephardic uh, world as well, the Eidot HaMizrach, as opposed to the Spanish and Portuguese, uh, where the Kabbalistic tradition is very uh, popular, very, uh, like, um, you know, embraced with a lot of enthusiasm. Now, the reason for the resistance to it, I would say, has to do, and again, I don't want to dwell on the history, it's not really our, our subject, but just by way of context, I think it has to do with the debacle of the Shabtai Tzvi catastrophe uh, in the 17th century, in which the false messiah known as Shabtai Tzvi, his name was Shabtai Tzvi, uh, who was the most catastrophic false messiah uh, to come upon the scene, certainly um, in the last uh, couple of thousand years. And he 
uh, was hailed as the Messiah by many Jews around the world, and his in, the enthusiasm people had for him and the, his popularity owed a lot to the popularization of Kabbalah. And therefore, when the rabbinic establishment was seeking to recover from the catastrophic demoralization that set in throughout the Jewish world in the wake of his apostasy when he became a Muslim to save his, his skin, uh, they sought to contain the spread and the popularization of Kabbalah and any ideas and any practices, any customs that were overtly Kabbalistic were shunned in certain circles, especially where Shabtai Tzvi's influence was the greatest. And therefore, when the, the disaster that set in as a result of his downfall was the most uh, acute. So the Spanish and Portuguese community in Amsterdam and elsewhere was part of that. And um, the, in Hamburg, in Germany as well, there was a lot of enthusiasm for Shabtai Tzvi. So they kind of turned their back on, on him and what he represented. And perhaps uh, we're ready to move on from that to a great extent. And maybe that's part of why the Ushbizin and certain other Kabbalistic ideas are gradually or maybe rapidly, steadily gaining uh, wider currency. Okay, that's by way of a little bit of context. I don't know if you're from my generation, the people who are listening to this year, um, but if you're wondering why you never heard about it growing up, then um, this is why. But it has, as I said, gained great currency today. So let's talk about it. So the seven Ushpizin, just to review, are Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, Moshe Aharon, I should say Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, and then Yosef, then Moshe Aharon, and then David, David HaMelech. And we welcome them. Now, some people welcome them the first night, and they leave it at that. Others welcome them every night. Others welcome them before every meal. The sequence of welcoming, though, is adjusted day by day. The first night, we welcome Avraham as the guest of honor, and the others come in his train. The second night, the second day, we welcome Yitzchak as the guest of honor, and the others accompany him as well. So there are seven so to speak, who come every night or every day, but they are addressed as the guest of honor in turn, sequentially one by one. We'll talk about this sequence uh, shortly. So what is the point of welcoming them? I mean, these are guests, in a way, they're model guests. They don't eat a lot of food. They don't take up space. They don't uh, drink your wine. They don't raid your whiskey cabinet. Um, you know, these are guests that anybody can accommodate with the greatest of ease, but what's the point of it? So the Mephoshim say at the very simple level that Sukkos is a time for inviting guests. It's a time for inviting genuine guests. And that the whole idea of inviting the Ushpizin is to prompt a person to the need to care for others, for those who are uh, without a sukkah of their own. Or maybe they have a, a sukkah, but they're alone and they uh, crave when they, they, they deserve the company of others. That To know that others care about them and for them and want to include them. I think it's worthwhile, since we're talking about guests, which be in our guests, to uh, mention the famous and very striking words of the Rambam in the laws of Yom Tov. So the Rambam has a section in Mishneh Torah about the laws of Yom Tov. And he calls this Shvisas Yom Tov, the laws of resting on Yom Tov, which, as we know, are quite similar to the laws of resting on Shabbos, but not identical. There are a number of differences. And the Rambam deals with that in a halachic sense. Then he turns to the mitzvah of Simchas Yom Tov, because Simchas Yom Tov is a mitzvah saseh. It's a positive commandment, the enjoyment, the celebration of the Yom Tov. And here the Rambam says, how does one celebrate Yom Tov? Well, if he is has a family, then he has to provide for the children what they enjoy, which are sweets and nuts and candies and that sort of thing. He has to provide for the women, uh, his wife, if he has, let's say, daughters or older. Uh, he needs to care, provide for them. And then it's uh, clothing or jewelry, things that they enjoy. And then for himself, men, so it mentions, uh, you might consider this a bit um, patronizing, meat and wine, you know, that's what a person enjoys. Obviously, it's not that each one gets only this. It's just as an example. But then, says the Rambam, listen to this, the, these words. When he eats and drinks, he is obligated to provide for the proselyte, 
for the orphan, for the widow, and with others who are poor, who are impoverished, or are unfortunate, or neglected, or marginalized. And it's not only those, thankfully, we live in a time and in a place where it's not that common for a Jewish person to be uh, without food, literally. I'm sure it does exist, tragically, but it's not as common as it once was. But we all, I'm sure, know people who are on their own, who could benefit from the camaraderie, from the uh, expression of concern and of, of fraternity, of friendship, to invite them into Klum. Says the Rambam, listen to this, Avomish Noel Dalsos Chatzero, but someone who locks the, the, the gates of his courtyard, and he eats and drinks, he and his children and his wife. And he doesn't provide for those who are poor and those who are down and out, down on their luck, perhaps. That is not a simcha of the mitzvah, even though he's uh, fulfilled what we said in the first part of this paragraph. It's provided for himself, for his family. They're having a great time. They're celebrating Yom Tov. But says the Rambam, this is not simchas mitzvah. This is not a celebration of a of a, of a mitzvah. El simchas kreso. This is a celebration of his stomach. He's only concerned for himself and his immediate uh, dependence. He doesn't look beyond that. Someone who locks the door of his court, that doesn't mean you've got to allow intruders and, and ne'er-do-wells. But the point is that he doesn't uh, extend his purview to include those who are in need. Not, not every person is in a position to invite guests, perhaps, according to his uh, particular circumstances, but this is the theme that the Rambam mentions uh, here. And as I say, if a person is not in that position, then he can contribute, he can make a charitable donation to a local tzedakah that cares for those who are in need. You've got Karen Shabbos and other, Tom Chay Shabbos and other uh, uh, charitable uh, entities, whether in our community in Northwest London or everywhere in the Jewish world as well. So I would like to suggest at the simple level that the Ushpiz and Ansukas are intended to highlight and to remind us of the need to invite guests to our sukkah, genuine guests who do require or, or benefit from our, from our um, attention and our friendship and our largesse as well, uh, perhaps. As to the question is why sukkahs in particular, as opposed to, uh, let's say, every Shabbos or the other regalim. So I will get to a deeper explanation shortly, but I was speculating that maybe at this simple level, Sukkot, of course, follows immediately from the uh, uh, awesome days, the days of awe, Yamim no Ra'im, Rosh Hashanah, Saras Tshuva, Yom Kippur. These are times when a person, uh, let's say, is sensitized to the need for self-improvement, there is a certain weighty component, atmosphere, character to these days. When Yom Kippur comes, we naturally feel a sense of release and relief and exuberance. And someone who has the means to celebrate Sukkot naturally is, is inclined to do so. And, you know, this is a source of joy very much for him. Someone who doesn't have the means. He has the, let's say, weightiness. He has the, the, the weight of the judgment of Rosh Hashanah, Aser Tshuva, Yom Kippur, that he has, but he may not have it within, the, the, he doesn't have the financial wherewithal to celebrate uh, um, Sukkot. So there's a particularly acute need, therefore, to reach out to others. Uh, we could also say about Pesach, even though, of course, there's a mitzvah of inviting guests for Pesach, especially the Seder, but when it comes to Pesach, because of the Pesach Seder, so there, according to the original um, practice in antiquity, where there's a Korban Pesach, so it was natural to invite guests or extended family there. And maybe that kind of uh, uh, sensitivity is already highlighted through the Pesach ritual. And the Seder, we begin by saying, whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. So perhaps that important uh, theme of Pesach already is incorporated into the sequence, into the essential um, mitzvah of Pesach. And as I said, maybe this is why we have the tradition of the Ushpizen on Sukkot's time. Now, these seven are known as the seven shepherds, even though we've called them seven wise men. I'm sure they were wise, but ultimately they're 
greatness in each of them, in, in each of the cases, is not so much because of wisdom, really, or intellectual acumen, or even the great amount of knowledge that they possess. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, he's regarded as the great prophet. I'm sure that his level of Torah knowledge vastly, uh, you know, dwarfs that of any other person for certain. But nevertheless, as we'll see shortly, his role within these seven is not so much for wisdom or acumen. There is someone who's known as the wisest of all men. That's Shlomo HaMelech, but he's not among these seven. So even though we've called them seven wise men, it's not a tongue in cheek. These are seven shepherds. We know them as shepherds in the sense that they are the uh, leaders of the Jewish people in each generation, and as we'll see collectively, they continue to play a role in our lives, or they should do so. So let's consider um, the sequence of these seven. Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov, naturally, these are three generations. Now, the next one sequentially would naturally be Yosef, and according to the Shla, which is one of the important um, uh, popular Kabbalistic works written by Rabbi Yeshar Halevi Horovitz in Tzvat in the 17th century. So he uses the chronological, the let's say intuitively um, uh, obvious chronological order. Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yosef is the next generation. Then Moshe Aharon, and then many generations later, uh, David HaMelech. However, uh, the a Kabbalistic tradition of the Ari and other sources, and that has become certainly the most popular and the most widespread nowadays, partly because, as I said, the whole Ushbizen, the power behind it is the fascination with Kabbalah that is a characteristic of our times. And therefore, much more commonplace is the a tradition of the Ari in which the seven personalities are arranged not in order of chronology, although mostly chrono chronological, as we shall see, but rather in accordance with the sefirot. The sefirot are the divine emanations. These seven visitors represent each of them a different quality. Each one is distinguished. Each one is associated with a particular midah. So Avraham is known for chesed. Chesed is the first of the seven sefirot. Yitzchak is known for gevura. Now, I just want to clarify, perhaps it's for, many are familiar with this, but just to, um, for, for clarity's sake, chesed is loving kindness, pretty straightforward. It means to care for others, concern for others. I'm talking about the biography of Abraham, the patriarch. He's about welcoming guests, pleading, arguing with God, even on behalf of the people of Sodom. Abraham is all about chesed. Yitzchak is about gvura. Gvura is power or strength, but it doesn't mean physical prowess, nor does it mean courage. It means inner strength. It means self-control. It means the strength, a power of discipline. Yitzchak's greatness was his willingness to give up his life on the Akedah. The image of Yitzchak bound on the, the altar the Mizbeach prepared to give his life in accordance with the divine command exemplifies the greatness of Yitzchak. Whereas Abraham's greatness is in his action, the greatness of Yitzchak is in his self-control, his submission, his willingness, his preparedness to uh, sacrifice uh, himself, even if need be, for, for God. And frequently, I think, our own experience confirms that the power to desist, the power to control one's self is the greatest strength of all and possibly uh, is even greater than the ability to act or to, to, um, uh, to, to let's say, project one's self outward. We're not suggesting that one or the other is more important. We need them both. We need them both. But uh, Chesed and Gvura, of course, are contrasting. They are like, they balance one another. Y Yaakov, Avram Yitzhak, Yaakov is associated with Tiferes. Tiferes means uh, like um, uh, splendor. It is the balance. Yaakov represents the balance between the two. That's why Yaakov is called Ishtam. He is the one who is perfect. Yaakov is uh, when we invite the Yushvis and we say, 
Leo Yaakov Shalimta, Yaakov who is Shalem, because the Pasuk says, Veavo Yaakov Shalem Ir Shem. Yaakov is described as the one who is whole, who is complete. In other words, he's balanced. He doesn't have a um, uh, inclination uh, th that is sort of distorts his character in one direction or the other. He represents the amalgamation, the synthesis of Abraham and Yitzhak. Now, the, in this Sphira sequence, the next one is Netzach. So we've got Chesed, Gvura, Tiferes. The next one is Netzach. Now, Netzach means victory, Nitzachon, but it also means, and this is its meaning here, eternity or eternality, that which is eternal. Moshe is associated with the, the quality of Netzach, the uh, Sephira, the emanation of Netzach, because what Moshe did for the Jewish people, or for mankind even, is eternal. He gave us the Torah. The Torah is here forever. Uh, he took us out of Egyptian bondage. We're not going back to Egypt ever again. We can go back to visit. Uh, actually, Jewish Jews have lived in Egypt for a long, long time. I mean, in, in post-biblical times as well. But they haven't gone back as slaves. The Jews who were redeemed from Egypt as slaves through Moshe, that is permanent. So Moshe represents Netzach. And therefore, Moshe, according to the Ari, is the fourth uh, of these Ushbizim. Aharon is the companion of Moshe. Now, uh, Aharon is associated with glory, with Hod, because he was the Kohen Gadol and his garments were, were glorious. But at a deeper level, of course, Moshe and Aharon are a dyad. They are a pair. Moshe represents judgment. That is to say, uh, the law which is handed down in a definitive manner uh, in which one is let's say, disputants, litigants, one is uh, vindicated, one is um, condemned, as the case may be. Aharon, however, represents conciliation. Aharon is the one who pursues peace, who loves peace and pursues peace. Moshe and Aharon, they have to go together. Each one by himself, each, that is to say, each midah, each uh, quality, each sephira on its own requires the other one to offset it. There is a need for both Moshe representing the, the law and Aharon representing the compromise, representing the conciliation. Aharon is the one who loves peace and pursues peace. Yosef, according to this sequence, comes next. He's number six because he is the sixth sphere is Yesod. Yesod is foundation. We'll talk about that further in a moment. And finally, King David is going to be the, the last one. So you see that Yosef is going to be displaced chronologically because Yosef and David also need to go next to one another. We'll explain why shortly. So Yosef is identified, if you look in your Siddur or your Machsor, you'll see that according to the introduction to the welcome that is extended to these visitors, these Ushbizim, uh, each one is identified with a certain moniker, sabrakwi, you could say. Moshe, I'm sorry, Avraham is Rechima, the one who is beloved, because the passage says, Zera Avraham Ohavi, Avraham is one who loves God. So Avraham Rechima means Avraham is beloved. Ime Yitzchak Akidita, Yitzchak was bound, the Akeda was bound on the altar. Yaakov Shalimta, we mentioned, is called Shalem, because Yaakov is the one who is Shalem, he's complete in the sense that he is the balance of Abraham and Yitzchak. With him, Moshe Raya Mehimna, Moshe the faithful shepherd. That doesn't require explanation. He was a shepherd literally, and then he became the shepherd of the Jewish people. Ime Aharon, as I said, really all the seven are known as shepherds as well. Actually, all of the seven were shepherds in their actual careers. The only exception is Aharon, who may also have been a shepherd, but all the others we know explicitly were shepherds. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that was the family business for generations. Yosef also was a shepherd. The Torah says that explicitly. Uh, he used to um, get along with his brothers, not that well, really, but he was participating in the shepherding. Yosef was a shepherd. Uh, Moshe was certainly a shepherd. King David also was a shepherd before he was a king. Uh, so anyway, but Moshe is the, the classic shepherd in that he was the shepherd of the Jewish people of his generation. Aharon is called Kahana Kadisha, the holy um, uh, priest. 
Ime Yosef Tzadikaya. Yosef Tzadikaya. Yosef is called the Tzadik. And with him is Malka, is David Malka Meshicha, the anointed king. Of course, he was anointed by Shmuel Hamelech. He was anointed by, by Samuel the prophet to be the king. But it also alludes to the descendant of David Hamelech, who is the Mashiach, whose arrival we still await. The one who will be anointed to be ultimately the redeemer of the Jewish people and of all mankind, who is the descendant, of course, of David Hamelech. That's Mashiach. So uh, David Malka Meshicha. Uh, speaks of King David and alludes to his descendant, the Mashiach, whose uh, arrival we still await. Why is Yosef called Sadika? Yosef is known as the righteous one because although all of these people could uh, um, fairly be described as Sadikim, but Yosef is called a Tzadik because his defining moment in his career in terms of his character, okay, you could say in terms of his CV, probably when he became the viceroy, but in terms of his character, the defining moment for him was when he was propositioned repeatedly by the wife of Potiphar to the point when he had apparently decided to succumb to her blandishments. And as the Torah describes very clearly, there was no one else around and she importuned him and she grabbed hold of him and she pleaded with him. And it is evident even from the text, certainly from the rabbinic tradition, that he is resolved to resist her uh, advances had completely evaporated. He was going to succumb to her, the loneliness and the alienation from his family and everything just was too much for him. And at the last moment, he resisted at great cost. He fled. He left his garment with her. He ran outside, presumably uh, naked. He was subjected to the greatest humiliation thereby. Plus, he was framed by her. He was uh, consigned to the dungeon for years. And the greatness, the reason he's called the is that he was tempted and he resisted. And in that sense, he is a, um, an example to other frail humans who also are confronted with temptation. But Yosef resisted the temptation and therein lay his greatness. That's why it's called Yosef Tzadika. And that is why he's associated with the sixth sphere, which is Yesod. Yesod means foundation. But at a deeper level, Yesod means the foundation of the, uh, the creation of the next generation. Yesod is associated with the sexual energy and the sexual capacity and the ability to sublimate and to uh, direct and to restrain that most potent uh, human uh, urge. So Yosef is called the tzaddik for the reason that we explained, and that's why he's associated with Yesod, Yesod referring to that uh, drive which can only be restrained and contained with uh, great effort and great uh, discipline. So this is the greatness of Yosef, and that's why he's called Yosef Hatzadik. Now, the uh, order, as I said, is subject to different um, uh, traditions. The order of the Ari has certainly become today more widespread and more fashionable, let's say, more, much more uh, uh, in vogue. And it reflects the deeper significance day by day of these uh, uh, Ushpizin. As I said, we invite them all, but each one takes turn being, so to speak, the guest of honor. It's interesting that on Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of Sukkot, that is to say, the seventh day of Sukkot, following Hoshana Rabbah, we have Shemini Atzeris, which although we experience it as a, like, um, epilogue to Sukkot, excuse me, is a festival in its own right. So, the last day of Sukkot technically is uh, Hoshana Rabbah, and on that day, we take the uh, um, 
Arava, where we take the Arba Minim and we walk around the Bima seven times and we take the Oshanos. But what I'm trying to get at here is that for those who participate in this, or even if you don't, if you make use of your Sidu or your Machsa, you will see that after each circuit, and we go around seven times, and after each circuit, there's a certain Pasuk which we recite. And that Pasuk, which you may have seen it, you may have said it, you may not have considered too closely its significance, but as we'll see right now, those seven verses, those seven psukim correspond to the seven ushpizin and the seven sefirot. So the first one is, Ki amarti olam chesed For I have said the world shall be built with kindness. Olam chesed because the first, like hakafa, the first day is associated with Abraham, who is the one of chesed, loving kindness. The next pasuk, we say, the next the next. Um, circuit, we say, in gevura, ta'oz yadcha, torum yiminecha. yours is the arm with strength, show us the power of your hand, raise high your right hand. Okay, there's a pasuk in Tehillim. So there you have gevura, gevura, which we said means power or strength. It means inner strength, self-control. Then this third pasuk is titain emes li Yaakov chesed Abraham. Now there we mention Yaakov specifically, or, or Yaakov by name. And he is the third of the Ushpizin. MS, he ten MS the Yaakov, this expression, MS the Yaakov, truth to Yaakov, you see the word MS has within it, has within it the letters Taf Mem, Tam, because Yaakov is called Ish Tam Yoshev Ohalim. So Titan MS the Yaakov alludes to the fact that Yaakov is the Ish Tam, also Tamim, Tamim meaning perfect. Also, the word MS, which means truth, of course, is itself a balanced word. The Aleph is the beginning of the alphabet, the tough is the end, the Mem is the middle. So the word MS itself suggests the balance, the completion, the sort of, uh, as I said before, the um, uh, absence of extremism or tendency towards one or another uh, extreme. So Titan Emes the Yaakov, Yaakov represents the one who is the amalgamation or the synthesis of Abraham and Yitzchak. The fourth circuit, we say Neimos Bimincha Netzach. There is delight at your right hand for triumph. And then we have the word Netzach. And as we said, the fourth sphere is that of Moshe corresponding to Netzach. Then the next circuit, we say Adunoi Adunene Ma'adir Shimcha B'chol Haaretz. Asher Tana Hodcha Al Hashamayim. How mighty is your name throughout the earth? For it, for it were fit that you place your splendor above the heavens. So a hod is splendor or glory, and this corresponds to Aharon. We said is the Kohen Gadol who wears the, the, the garments for splendor. The sixth one here is where we refer to what I said a few minutes ago, that Yosef is the tzaddik. And the pasuk here is tzaddik adunoi b'chol dracha b'chasid b'chol ma'asa. That pasuk is familiar to us. We say it a few times a day in Ashrei. So the letter tzaddik there, tzaddik, Hashem b'chol dracha. Now, it doesn't say yesod, but remember we said tzaddik is a remez to the yesod. He's, Yosef is called a tzaddik because of his ability to restrain that aspect of his uh, life of his, of his character. And there's a well-known pasuk in Mishle, in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25, tzaddik yesod olam. The righteous person is the foundation of the earth. So when it says tzaddik, you see, in the uh, Kabbalistic literature, the word yesod is like a euphemism for sexual urge, sexual restraint, sexual uh, um, activity, Yisod has that role. And because it's a well-known euphemism, so they didn't even want to use the word Yisod. They used the word Tzadik to allude to the word Yisod, because as I said, the Pasuk says, Tzadik Yisod Alam. Uh, in Hasidic shtibel culture, and among Sephardim, Eidot HaMizrach as well, the most sought-after aliyah on Shabbos, of which there are seven, the most sought-after is the sixth. The first one goes to the Kohen. If you're not a Kohen, you're not eligible for it. The second one goes to a Levi. The same thing applies. The first one, which is, so to speak, up for grabs, that the Gabai or whoever it is can 
allocate to the one who is most uh, worthy or deserving or prominent or righteous is shlishi. Classically, shlishi is the most sought after, therefore, for the reason that I said. It's the first one that's available to anyone. But in shtibal culture, shishi is more sought after because of this puzzle, tzaddik yisod olam. Shishi is the tzaddik. So since the sixth circuit is associated with the tzaddik, so the sixth aliyah goes to the tzaddik. So therefore they give it to the rabbi or if there's a visiting uh, Rosh Hashiva or a visiting uh, rabbi, someone who's very uh, distinguished, so they'll give him shishi. And as I said, it's greatly sought after and occasionally quarreled over, uh, hopefully not. But that is the significance of shishi, of the sixth one is tzaddik uh, Hashem Bechol Dracham, because the pasuk says tzaddik yesod olam. Finally, the seventh circuit, we say a few psukim. And the first one is the most important because it contains within it a remez, a hint to all seven sefirot. It's a posseg that's familiar to us, even if you don't remember the seventh circuit on Hoshana Rabbah morning, you don't have uh, you know that recollection, but it's very familiar to us because we say it every time we take the sefer out of the Aaron Kodesh. This is a verse in Second uh, Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, but you can find it in your Siddur. If you look where we take out the Sefer Torah, that's the Pasha that we say, we often sing it. So that Pasuk alludes to all seven. L'chashem ha-gedula, Gedula greatness is uh, alludes to chesed because greatness, like expansiveness, is chesed. A person who is outer directed, who is sort of uh, big hearted, like like that kind of big personality. The word gedula is associated with chesed to provide for others. Gevura, we've said already, gevura is its counterpart. Tiferes, Tiferes is splendor. We said that Yaakov is associated with Tiferes. Tiferes, again, is the amalgamation, the synthesis. The Hanetzach is the fourth Sephira. The Hod is the fifth Sephira. <clears throat> what is the sixth Sephira? We said already, it's Yesod. So here, I told you, often they don't like to even use the word Yesod because it's such a well-known euphemism. It's as if we don't even want to say Yesod meaning foundation. So the words ki chol, the mathematical minds will reckon the numerical value. Ki chol is gematria 80, because ki chaf yud is 20 plus 10 is 30. Kol is 20 plus 30 is 50. So it's 80. Ki chol is 80. Gematria yesod. So ki chol bashamayim, ki chol alludes to the gematria of Yesod. So in this passage, we have the first six sefirot, and then we've got the seventh. Kichol b'ashamayim v'avras l'cha adonai ha-mamlacha v'hamis nasein l'cholosh. Mamlacha, of course, Malchus is David HaMelech. So this passage incorporates all seven sefirot, and without maybe realizing it, we recite this passage when we take out the Sefer Torah, and it's partly for this reason. It's partly because it alludes to all of the seven sefirot representing the divine emanations, the way that Hashem, uh, like, um, is uh, the, the qualities, the characteristics that Hashem displays and that we must seek to, uh, to emulate. I'd like to now consider at a deeper level why the Sefiro, I'm sorry, why the Ushpizin are associated with the festival of Sukkot in particular. After all, all of those great uh, Sadiqim, great uh, personalities, uh, shepherds, their role in Jewish history and their contribution symbolically to Jewish thought and to Jewish life is not limited to Sukkot, certainly. And it isn't obvious how any of them are particularly associated with Sukkot, or at least you probably could show how they are, you know, in some aspect, but, you know, it doesn't immediately um, uh, bring to mind that association. 
So let me tell you what I saw in the writings of the Slonimer Rebbe, Rabbi Noach, Rabbi Shalom Noach Brazovsky, uh, the uh, author of Nitivot Shalom, and Nitivot Shalom has become very uh, popular, uh, not only among Slonimer Hasidim and Hasidim generally, but much more widely as well, myself included. I studied his uh, um, collection of uh, essays, originally oral, you know, drushes that were presented on the uh, week by week. Um, and they've been collected and published. And I studied that to great uh, uh, personal um, uh, inspiration and satisfaction. Anyway, let me tell you what he says about our subject and we'll, we'll end with that thought. He asks the question, why do they come? Why do we uh, associate the Ushbizen with Sukkot in particular? And he says that these uh, shepherds, these uh, Avos Ha'olam represent the process by which the world can achieve its rectification. What's called in the Kabbalistic literature, Olam Hatikun. So the Hashem created the world in an idyllic manner in Gan Eden. And over time, the Torah describes the hate of Adam and Chava, the downfall of man as a result, the deterioration, so that ultimately there was a flood of Noah 10 generations later, and then a further 10 generations until we got to Avram Avinu. Again, degradation going down and down. With Avraham began the Olam Hatikun. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, each of the seven Sadiq and the seven shepherds brought into the world the potential, gave us the tools to perfect the world, to correct the world, to repair the world, not in the sense that it's been, it has become used popular in progressive or secular Jewish circles, tikkun olam. This is a Kabbalistic idea which refers to the way that a person, through studying and appreciating and imbibing and modeling these behaviors that are represented by these Torah personalities and that are uh, like developed in our Torah literature for these seven sefirot, these divine emanations, we need to exemplify those emanations ourselves. Says Aslan Rebbe that just as the world is a sequence of years that pass year by year and we believe that we're heading towards uh, a purpose and towards a, a fulfillment of the divine uh, destiny for mankind. In a similar way, every year is a unit in its own right as well. And the cycle of the Jewish year, we look back on the year, on Rosh Hashanah, we, well, we look forward to the year ahead, of course, but we hopefully reflect on the year before us. Certainly on Yom Kippur, we reflect on our uh, behavior and ways in which we need to improve. So we recognize that the new year is a new opportunity, a new beginning. Since it's a new beginning, so we need to invoke the merit and the example of the Ushpizen, representing the seven Sifirot at the beginning of the year. This begins our own personal Olam Hatikun. Just as from God's point of view, in ways that surely transcend our understanding, but we can grasp it in a very limited way. Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, the other tzaddikim, they infuse within the world the process, the foundations of Olam HaTikun. In a similar way, we can do the same. So once we have achieved the kapara, the atonement of Yom Kippur, once we are cleansed, once we emerge from Yom Kippur, as we all did last night, uh, just around this time, a bit earlier, about an, uh, an hour uh, uh, 25 hours ago, uh, cleansed, exhilarated with a sense of release and relief and joy that we are now uh, like uh, spiritually and emotionally prepared to proceed in the, the year ahead. So now we draw on the inspiration and the example of these seven Ushbizen during the festival of Sukkot. Because as we, be, we began by saying, the Yomi Narayim are a time of awe as they're called, days of all. Sukkot is a time of joy, time of exhilaration, and we harness the inspiration of the Aserah Shemei 
and we apply it to the joy of Sukkot, and then we invoke and we invite the presence spiritually or symbolically of these seven uh, Ushpis. So these are my thoughts about Sukkot and the seven wise men. Um, someone asked me, what about the wise women? Of course, none of these men are, are uh, so to speak, um, what they represent is not limited to the male of the species. Uh, they contain a lesson and a meaning which is relevant for all of us. Uh, you know, whether there are seven ushpizot, uh, maybe some someday we can contemplate that. I'm not aware of any such uh, compendium. Maybe there would be sometime. But in any case, uh, those are my thoughts. I wish everyone a uh, wonderful, uplifting, uh, joyful Zman Sim Chasenu. And with this, we conclude our uh, Tishrei series. And I hope that that, uh, like me, you feel as if we've been on a journey together and uh, we have hopefully emerged uh, intellectually stimulated and uh, enriched, not just by my shirim, of course, but by the experience itself. And Bezat Hashem, I look forward to joining together again in two weeks' time. We won't do it next Thursday. We're taking a slight brief recess for Sukkot. But in Hashem, in two weeks' time, we're going to continue on Thursday night with my new friend for the year. And his identity will be revealed when we get there. We're not ready to uh, disclose it now. It's embargoed still. But I have chosen a friend for the new year, and I'm really excited about sharing uh, with you the coming cycle of the Torah reading, the insights uh, from my new friend. So thank you very much. And I wish everyone a Chag Sameach and Gemar Chatima Tova. May the new year hold good things for us all.